Thanks for joining me today in this very special episode on digital well-being for our kids and us as parents, actually. We're going to have a great conversation today with a leading expert in this area who I am so grateful um, has agreed to join us today. Um, Dr. Christy Goodwin is based in Australia. She is one of the leading digital well-being and performance experts. She is the author of Raising Your Child in a Digital World. She's a speaker. She is a media commentator and a digital well-being researcher. Two of the things, though, that I most highly value in Christy and her work is that she is practical and she comes from a real life informed position. She's a mom of several kids who truly gets the lived experience of raising kids in this digital world. And she's an educator. She comes with 14 years of education experience in the school system uh, before she became an academic and an international speaker on the topic. There's so much we can learn from her. Um, so I'm so grateful to have her time today and to tap into her wisdom on the topic. So Christy, thanks so much for joining us and uh, welcome to Parenting in the Trenches. Good to have you here. I, I work with parents from who support kids who are really small all the way up to the late teen years um, and entering kind of empty nesting phase. They're wanting to support independence at that point, but there's so many boundary questions around how do I support my kids' digital well-being all the way across the developmental stages. So before we get into kind of specifics, could you help us who are the generation who feel very behind the eight ball, like we don't really, we can't keep up, we, can't, we don't know it all, um, but we want so badly to set ourselves and our kids up for a healthy relationship with digital equipment and online behavior stuff. Can you help us with that? Just top, top suggestions for setting okay. that up well. Well, I am glad you identified that uh, many parents feel like they're on the back foot. And this is actually the very first generation of children and adolescents who know far more about a topic than what their parents and caregivers do. So the parenting dynamic has shifted, whether you've got a three-year-old or a 13-year-old. Um, I think most of us would agree as parents that our kids um, by far surpass our technological yes. prowess and skill set. And I say to parents, that is probably the case. And use that to your advantage, you know, get them to program the blu-ray dvd player without the manual that you can't locate um get them to set yep. up your smartphone for you in in five seconds in a way that you could never imagine but what i'm going to reassure parents is that um, you do have things that your child and adolescent doesn't have. And in particular, my research looks at the brain and we know that the prefrontal cortex, so the part of the brain that helps us make good decisions, it helps us with problem solving, it's not fully developed until late 20s for males and early 20s for females. So if you are a parent of a, a toddler or a teenager, that part of their brain isn't developed. And so you are very well equipped, despite lacking in technical skills, you are very well equipped as an adult with a fully developed prefrontal cortex to help your child or your, I call them screen agers, um, navigate the digital world. So I say we have to be either for for young children, we have to be the pilot of the digital plane. And if you are parenting an adolescent, you need to be the co-pilot. You need to be sitting side by side with them because when they hit digital turbulence, and they will, when they see something inappropriate, when they're a victim of cyberbullying, um, when they literally are throwing techno tantrums, you need to be there to help them to course correct. But if you're in way back in economy class at the back of the plane and your child or teen is being the pilot, when they hit this digital turbulence, they don't have the brain architecture to know how to cope. So I encourage parents to be either the pilot or the co-pilot of the plane. And I say, you've just got to get three Bs when you are the pilot or the co-pilot. And you alluded to it perfectly in that introduction there. And the first B is boundaries. We've got to establish boundaries, not on our children, but with them. We need to come up with rules and parameters. And I think um, many parents from my experience, having spoken to thousands of parents throughout the world, many parents focus on the how much. They, they have very strict limits yeah. on how much time their children should have with totally. screens. And that is great because, and, and it's really important. But the second B, uh, sorry, the, the, the other boundaries that I think are just as, if not more critical is to know what, what are they doing online? Is it active? Yeah. 
Is it passive? Is it leisure? Is it learning? And this is why I think I think the pandemic has really thrust a spotlight on screen time because the whole concept of screen time has become obsolete. If they're doing remote learning, um, if they're connecting with their peers, that's very different to them just sitting there passively consuming content. So we need to focus on boundaries beyond the how much. I think we need to have boundaries around what also when the time of the day makes a huge impact on your child's physical and psychological well-being, and we can come back to that if you'd like. Um, boundaries around where, you know, where are the no-go tech zones in your house? Um, boundaries around how are they using them in ways that will support their vision and their hearing and their musculoskeletal health because we know excessive or inappropriate use is really derailing their physical health. Um, and also boundaries around who they're interacting with. So the first B is boundaries. The second B is basic needs, making sure that their time on digital devices doesn't supersede, doesn't erode or compromise their basic physical and psychological needs. So are they physically active? Are they getting a sufficient amount of sleep? Are they interacting with real people in real time? Making sure that those basic needs that that neuroscience and and psychology tells us are are fundamental to a a child or an adolescent's wellbeing are not being displaced by the digital intruder. And and the third B, and I know this one seems counterintuitive and I know this one's really hard, but is to ensure that your child and teen has opportunities for boredom, that they have time to digitally disconnect. Um, vital for their physical health, mental well-being, but also so they can form a, a concept of who they are. If you are constantly tethered to technology yeah. um, and processing information, you never get to formulate that that image of who you are. So try to be the pilot or the co-pilot of the plane, depending on the age of your, your child. And as they get older, we want to be taking our hands off that dashboard. Um, I don't say go hands-free, and I certainly wouldn't say go hands-free and, and let the autopilot step in early on. Yeah. But over time, we want to skill our kids into developing these healthy behaviours. And this is why I say to parents, the only way they can cultivate and practise those skills is by using technology. This is why I'm not a fan of, mm. of bands yeah. or very, you know. Abstinence of it, yeah. That's right. Digital amputation doesn't work. What it does is drive the behaviour underground. So they'll figure out once when restrictions are lifted and we go back to some sort of normality, whose friends have more relaxed screen time rules and they'll start gravitating there. Or you might think you've confiscated or, or taken their phone away at night and they've got a decoy one or you know another one hidden somewhere else. So talk openly, be that pilot or co-pilot and your child will um, learn these skills in an important um, and realistic context too. Mm-hmm. Okay, three Bs. So I'm going to add those to the show notes because I love it when you can condense something into, because yes. oftentimes when we're flooded and overwhelmed and panicky as parents about it, we get really emotional and we lose yes. track of, okay, what's my guide? What am, what am I trying to accomplish here? So I'll add those three Bs. Beautiful. Okay. Can we talk a bit about the techno tantrums? I That's Ooh. such a popular topic and I love that you've <laughs> coined a term around it because man, that speaks to Oh, all the things, right? Yes. The transition from screen to non-screen. What is that about? What's causing that? And does it look like, are there different reasons developmentally for the younger kids who struggle with that transition from older kids? Definitely. So I want to reassure parents, there's nothing wrong. A lot of parents think there's something wrong with their child, or they think that the fact that their child or their teenager is throwing a techno tantrum is a sign that they're addicted. And that's not the case at all. A a techno tantrum is what we'd call a typical neurobiological response. And I'm going to explain some of the reasons why they throw techno tantrums, but also give you some mum tested strategies that actually work to help um, alleviate or cope with them. So one of the first reasons that we get the techno tantrum is because when our kids are online, whether that's gaming, watching YouTube, chatting with their friends, it's usually a pleasurable experience. So their brain is secreting the neurotransmitter dopamine and dopamine um, is the pleasure neurotransmitter. And so they crave more more and more of it. So when you digitally disconnect them, when you amputate them from their devices, they are literally having that withdrawal of dopamine. So two strategies that I recommend to cope with this. The first one, and it sounds very fancy, but it's really easy. It's called cognitive priming. It means warn your child before they're going to, you're going to terminate their screen time. So just going in to wherever they are in their bedroom or in the lounge room and and demanding that they turn it off is not going to be met with much success. 
Um, I know I'm going to um, embarrass myself here, but often I find it hard if I've delivered a, a seminar in the evening to turn my brain off. So I um, self-soothe, shall I say, with a little bit of trashy TV. Now, if my husband was to come out halfway through an episode, um, and I won't reveal what I watch, <laughs> Your opinion of me might take a nosedive. But if he was to do that, I would be irate. But we do this to our kids all of the time. They might be halfway yeah. through a, a battle or halfway through an interesting dialogue with their peers and we terminate them. So if the first strategy is warn them, it could be as simple as when you get to the next level, when you finish this episode, when you've sent the next message, I'd like you to turn it off. And that's a bonus tip there. When they turn it off, it sounds like a really simple gesture but it gives them a sense of agency. They feel like they've got some control as opposed to you, you know, trying to wrestle the yeah. device from their clutches. Yeah. So first one is warn them that their time's going to end um, and encourage them to switch it off. The second strategy that works here with the dopamine is to give them an appealing transition activity. So to say to them, put, put your gaming console away and go and do your maths homework, not an appealing transition. Um, you know, put your phone away and go and tidy your bedroom equally less enticing proposition. So we need yeah. to give them, and it doesn't need to be a long menu, a choice of two. When you've turned off the, the, the tablet, would you like to ride your bike or take a dog, the dog for a, a walk around the block? When you have finished with your, your phone, finished sending the messages, would you like to have a shower or would you like to go and read your book? Two activities that you know your child likes mm -hmm. to do. Bonus points if it does involve physical activity because physical activity will give them some of that dopamine, will give them some serotonin and other positive neurotransmitters that will help to prevent that sort of techno tantrum. The second um, reason we get the techno tantrum, and we as adults don't throw techno tantrums because hopefully most of us have that fully developed prefrontal cortex and we've got some self regulation. Some of us, do. Some of us most, do, days. Yeah. most days. <laughs> most um, days, yeah. <laughs> but one of the reasons we know that we we struggle to turn off, you know, we find it hard to stop the scroll at night or to go on holidays. I call it going laptopless, where you, you don't take your laptop or <laughs> not checking. You know, we go in to our inboxes um, all of the time. You know, research tells us that most adults are now no longer more than ninety, uh, sorry, no longer more than one meter proximity from their smartphone wow. for ninety five percent of the day. We are tethered to Isn't technology. Isn't that unbelievable? How did we get to that point? We did. Wow. Well, well there's a That's... whole reason there that, you know, the yeah, technology yeah. is being deliberately designed to, to yes. prey on our psychological vulnerabilities. Mm. But one of the reasons that our kids particularly, because remember, they don't have that self-regulation part of the brain fully developed. So when we use technology, it is a bottomless bowl. There are no stopping cues. There's no end point. You never get to a point like an invisible line yeah. of demarcation that says you are done. I don't know about you, um, but I never get to inbox zero. You know, there's always something else. Or we can refresh social media and more comes in. Our kids are watching YouTube and on that right-hand side in the up next section are videos tailored, very curated videos based on the Google recommendation algorithm to try and tempt them to watching more. So they never had that sense of being done. And so this is why it's for younger kids. And I usually recommend under the age of sort of eight, don't give them an amount of time because time is a very abstract concept. Instead, what you're better off to do is give them quantity. So tell them how many episodes they can watch on YouTube. How many battles of Fortnite can they have? Um, how many levels can they get to in the puzzle that they're completing? Just give them tangible measures. The other idea with this state of insufficiency is to give them the end point, give them the cutoff time rather than an amount of time because we often get into that digital rabbit hole. Um, another reason we get the techno tantrum is because often their sensory and their nervous system has been overstimulated. And so this is why we get, and particularly with boys, I know many parents um, tell me that their boys post screen behavior is often aggressive. It can be physically mm -hmm. aggressive. Yeah. Um, girls tend to demonstrate their frustration and their big emotions with more subtle, in more subtle ways. So they'll use the look. I think most parents mm -hmm. of a, an adolescent or a female in their household knows the look, yeah. um, or they'll yeah. use language. Um, whereas boys tend to demonstrate their frustrations physically. And what is happening with that um, demonstration of frustration is they are trying to um, dispel all of the cortisol, the stress hormone that has built up because there have been things wheezing and, and beeping and flashing. And so their sensory and nervous system is really overstimulated. Um, so this is where you've got to green time, 
after screen time. If you can, get them outside. Nature has a calming, restorative effect on the brain. Physical activity gets them to discharge some of that cortisol. Um, if they are being physically aggressive, if you can, you might need to duck and weave. Um, but if you can physically touch them, when you, you touch your child, it releases oxytocin. And oxytocin is the love hormone. So even if it's just some strokes on the arm or a cuddle when they're telling you, you know, you're the worst parent in the world and you suck and I hate you because I could only game for four hours today, um, physical touch can help to, to um, calm them down. Um, we also know the online world, one of the reasons we get the techno tantrum is because it's always new and interesting. So it's that instant gratification that kids have become accustomed to. And that's why I really encourage one of the three Bs is to be okay and be comfortable with being bored. Um, if we become constantly, um, if we have this constant level of expectation that I'm going to be gratified and it's going to be instant and it's going to be easy and require very minimal mental effort, then I'm going to constantly be gravitating to the screen. So there's some of the main ways um, and chief things that we can do, but it comes back to those boundaries and clearly articulating before the screen's turned on. It is absolutely pointless trying to have these conversations with your child or teen once the device is in their clutches. Um, so conversations beforehand and firm boundaries um, around the what, but also that the how much and, and where and when. So it's, I, I'm fascinated by this concept of the, the detoxing of the cortisol and the idea of how do we replace dopamine uh, stimulation, right? So where, how do we produce that? Can, that can come from different methods. So as you say, green time can produce that same experience for a kid. Mm -hmm. And I've been playing with this with a lot with my own kids, but also just with clients and asking them to do try overlapping. So mm -hmm. not be in a different room, let their kid be on the screen and then come in and make the announcement, your five minutes is up, turn your screen off. But to actually spend that last five minutes sitting with them making eye Absolutely. contact, stroking their arm while they're playing so that the transition isn't so hard and fast of, because I think that that doesn't happen instantly, does it? No, the, the not brain. at all. And right. I, I right. love that idea of sitting side by side because it does two things. Um, one, it's a good cyber safety check. So you can, you know, do the quick yeah. check of what they're actually playing. But the second reason, and I think this one's more powerful, is that you're, you're sending a powerful message to your child or teen that you value, you're interested in their online pursuits. Now, you may not be, um, and maybe you have to fake it till you make it in this regard. Yeah. Um, but if you show some sort of interest, then it becomes less of the forbidden fruit and it becomes less of something that's taboo and, and secretive. So I think there's a whole range of other benefits apart from helping with that transition, which I definitely think it does do. Um, you're there to sort of, you'll, you'll notice, you know, um, nuances in their physical behavior as they're transitioning, which may be able to help you better choose a strategy that might work in that situation, as opposed from you screaming out from another room and your voice levels elevating and adding to the cortisol and um, yeah. perpetuating the problem. So there's huge merits. And I often say the basics work if you work the basics. And something as simple as sitting down with your child with any transition, whether it's a screen transition or non-screen transition, really has a profound impact. Yeah. Um, we're hardwired to be part of a biological, you know, sorry, we're yeah. biologically wired to be part of a tribe. We want that connection. Yeah. Um, and yeah, sitting side by side meets that need so beautifully and so easily. Yeah. So looking for ways to join, not be yes. opposed to our kids. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So effective strategies. I'm so hungry all the time in these interviews for just to give me all the effective strategies around boundary setting for both time and type of use when it comes to kids that are trying to become more independent. And we want to foster that. So in those early, like from maybe tween up, yep. as we're gradually working toward building their own sense of boundaries, um, what are some effective strategies to help our teens with that? My experience, and I, I run workshops with teens, is that when you present them with science and facts, they're much more receptive to hearing um, the boundaries that you are suggesting. When you just go in with a, these are the boundaries, these are the rules that I am imposing, and it's just because I am on mum or dad and they're our family rules, it will be met with um, little success from my experience. What really does work, um, at, and it, 
it's really hard to argue when you present facts and science, this is what's going on. So explaining to young people, for example, a common boundary that I know many parents struggle with um, is around um, screens before young people go to sleep. And the research tells us that at least 60 minutes, um, sometimes even 90 minutes before somebody goes to sleep really should be screen free. Um, the, the emission of blue light suppresses the body's production of melatonin. Um, we also know that that exposure, that melatonin, sorry, the blue light exposure also shortens the deep sleep stage. Um, so not only are they not getting enough of the sleep, but they're often not getting good quality of sleep. And wow. when we can show this to our young people, you know, when you wake up in the morning and you're feeling grouchy and grumpy and you can't concentrate at school or on your, on your classwork, it is because you haven't had not only the right volume of sleep, but also I haven't had that good quality of sleep either. So I think articulating um, those boundaries to our kids, um, but giving them the scientific underpinnings help them helps them to appreciate what it is that you're trying to impart. The second part of this strategy is definitely not imposing the boundaries on them, but instead getting their buy-in, you know, saying to them, look, I, we need to come up with some parameters around sleep and our screen use. What do you think would be um, a healthy, um, effective way for us to do this? And I'm sometimes kids will really try and test the limits, <laughs> they'll really push the, the, the boundaries. Um, but in many instances, kids have some really good insights and want strategies. So maybe it's, you know, I understand you might want to use your device before you go to bed, but could we, instead of you tapping, swiping and pinching on your device, could you listen to an audio book or would a podcast um, be a better better choice before you go to sleep? So getting their, their buy-in, again, underpinning it with that research um, and picking the times of the day when you have these conversations. You know, it is very easy as a parent when they've you know they've emotionally combusted and you're really frustrated about how screen time is being tackled in your house and you go and you say right almost present them with a contract and say these are our new your new um you know yeah. parameters around screen time sign on the bottom effective immediately and it's not going to be met with success so um you know we know often at night time the prefrontal cortex fatigues it is just worn out from constantly making decisions throughout the day and so part of the brain is called the amygdala it, it's the emotional hub of the brain it fires up at night and this bonus information is why most cyber bullying most online predators prey at night because that logical part of the brain is off and their amygdala their emotional hub is firing so not a good time of the day to be having these conversations so Preferably when they're a little bit more alert and awake, usually mid-morning, um, going somewhere neutral, so walking side by side or going to a cafe and having these conversations means they're also much less likely to yell um, in public. <laughs> so Brilliant. trying to be yeah. very selective about where and when you have those conversations too. But their buy-in is really critical. Otherwise, this will be a very lopsided agreement um, yeah. if you impose okay. it. Okay. And so to get the buy-in, the two strategies would be give them the right information. So it's not personal. This is not about yep. our relationship. This is about the quality of information I'm giving you to make good, healthy decisions together and collaborative problem solving when they're Absolutely. calm. Being you there. do it together and at the right time yes. when they're available to you, right? And mentally That's available true. to you. Okay. And as simple as saying to them, rather than just saying, we're going to sit down at, at you know, 9am, we're going to the local cafe and we need to talk about screens, not going to be met with, with okay. much um, pleasure, asking them, look, I, and telling them, being honest, I think it's really important that we talk about your phone use or how much you, you're gaming. I want us to come up with a solution together. Can you give me a couple of times when we could talk about this? And I know that might seem like we're, we're bowing down to our children, but I think, yeah. again, we're giving them that, that sense of agency um, and we're treating them, you know, in an adult, in, in the an adult's world, you wouldn't have your boss come in many instances and demand a meeting, you know, yeah. effective immediately. So I think they're really important skills and it's just... Um, you're just going to have much more success if you do it in a way um, that values their opinion rather than just, again, imposing it on them. They'll feel respected. You can yes. be direct, but they will feel a sense of respect when you come almost adult to adult in conversation with them. Absolutely. And they respond yeah, okay. accordingly. I am... Yeah. Having spoken to thousands of adolescents about screens um, and, and digital wellbeing, I am 
it never ceases to amaze me. I get goosebumps as I talk about this. The sophistication of their questions and the maturity and the interest that they have in this topic because it's so pertinent to them. And the last thing they want to be told is, you know, ban it, avoid it, it's bad for you, don't use it. Um, They recognise it's integral, um, but they also experience firsthand how um, damaging it can be at times and the, the really profound impact that it's having on them. So they want to learn the best ways to use it. They just don't want to be told, you know, ban it, avoid yeah, it. The hard line. You off. Mm. Right. So don't control them. Invite yes. them into conversation. Conversation. And that's what being that co-pilot is. You're sitting alongside them um, and yeah. helping them to navigate this rather than just saying, I'm going to take you yeah. to that destination. Yeah. And that applies in so many ways, right? But I think about mm. how how pertinent the digital piece is because it's how we interact now with people. It's how we learn through school. It's how it's all, it's the method in which we are interacting with our world in so many facets of life. So if we teach our kids, those negotiation skills, like you mentioned, this brilliant, like we're training them through this method to be good employees, to be good partners in our marriages to be good right it's a it's a social skill through the lens of how we're interacting is through a screen so often now but yeah completely okay yeah okay you're so immersed in this so there's a couple of things I want to ask I would love some quick and dirty tips and tricks for just specific flags or pitfalls uh online danger zones what, what's currently out there that parents should kind of have their ear to the, to the line about? I'm going to say two. Um, one I think most parents would be aware of, um, social media platforms, um, TikTok in particular. Um, I think we all recognise that the death by suicide that was streamed last year and then repurposed and shared you know, yeah. millions of times um, exemplified the pitfalls of these video sharing apps. Um, and many parents say to me, you know, I follow my young person online and I watch what they're posting and I check their DMs. And that's great as the, the co-pilot of the digital plane. Mm-hmm. I certainly encourage parents to do that with their adolescent. Do not sneak into their bedroom and do the, yeah. the digital audit when that's they're in the time. shower yeah. or in the bathroom because you will completely erode trust in that situation. Mm-hmm. Um What I will say um, is definitely social media, but what parents have got no control over now, um, thanks to these videos that appear to combust, you know, even on Instagram, um, Instagram stories, what you've got no control over is what your child has consumed and absorbed and the information that they are pulling out. Um, So I think we just, you know, be that co-pilot, talk to them about the risks, but the best thing, the absolute best thing you can do is to encourage your child from a young age. The minute you hand your toddler a smartphone or a tablet, you start these conversations, is that if there is a problem, if you see something inappropriate, if someone writes something unkind, if um, somebody writes a message that makes you feel uncomfortable in any way, if you see a video and then people aren't clothed, you know, it can be very age appropriate conversations, but encourage them to come to you. Tell me and I'm not going to, you know, confiscate the device. The research tells us overwhelmingly that in most cyberbullying cases, in most online predator um, situations, young people, despite programs that tell them go and tell a trusted adult, they do not go and tell a trusted adult because of the fear of digital amputation. They think they'll be cut off. They'll have the device taken away from them, the platform removed. Um, So I think definitely um, social media platforms. Another big concern that has come out of the pandemic, um, and they're related to social media platforms, but they're photo sharing sites. And a lot of young people are selling um, what should be said, very inappropriate photos online and are being remunerated for these. Um, They're under the guise of being um, anonymous to begin with, but very quickly their information um, is revealed. Um, And this is boys and girls. so I think, again, just trying to, to keep abreast of what the issues are and the apps and platforms, and it's hard. It is really hard yeah. as a parent. Um, you know, just when you get your head around TikTok, I hate to tell you, but something soon will come along and supersede that. Um, yeah. So I think it's being um, alert but not alarmed and, and having those ongoing conversations and know what it is that your child's using and the best way to do that is through that ongoing conversation and sitting with them side by side where you can. 
alert but not alarmed is so lovely to hear because I think when we're alarmed, that's when our you know, own instincts, the fight or flight response, right, as parents is to control. And then we have the hard line that we insert yeah. and we want to remove the device and we want to, and I get, I so hear the heart of parents who go, but I'm just doing it to protect them. I just want to keep them safe, right? So I get the, the intention is there, but the reaction actually backfires because then they stop telling you. Right. So that trust that you were talking about, I just I want to highlight that because I think we've to, that's our job as parents is to keep that peace in check because we can really have a powerful, positive influence. If we catch ourselves hearing our kids come to us, even if, if it's small things, not the whole story, but a flag of like, oh, I don't know if I should do that or watch that or this came up that we can enter that with a OK, tell me more rather than the instinct being OK, put it away you need a break. We're not doing that. Don't use that app anymore. It's how to use it. And thank you for being honest with me and telling me I'm on your team, right? We're together trying yes. to keep you safe. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think if we can, and I know, again, most parents have good intentions with using screen time as a punishment because most parents say, you know, it's the only commodity in my child or adolescent's life that oh. has some meaning to them. So withdrawing something that is of meaning is an effective strategy. And the research on punishments and rewards tells us in general, they, they, they're ineffective in the long term. And in general, rewards and punishments work more for the parent or the caregiver than what they do for the child or adolescent, because I pat myself in the back and say, yeah, I dealt yeah, with that situation. Okay, you know, I handed our swift sure. punishment, <sighs> you know, situation solved. And you've not looked at the root cause of what's driven the behavior. So um, yeah, rewards and punishments work in the short term and they work for the parent, they don't necessarily guide the behavior that we're wanting to, to change and adapt. Yeah. Are there physical, behavioral, emotional cues that you would suggest we watch for if our kids are consuming potentially harmful stuff, even if it's a slow drip, but they're, it's starting to impact their well-being? What are we watching for? What are some of the telltale signs of, okay, there's, they're affected negatively? So, and this is where it can become tricky because often some of the telltale signs, um, I often call them red flags of some problematic digital behaviours, can also just be what we would consider typical stages of development. So, um, you know, changes in their mood. Well, that can be attributed yeah. to, to hormonal changes. Um, but if you see, and, and again, I think I say to parents, trust your intuition. I think if there's any concerning behaviours that you are noticing and perhaps have been corroborated by other people, I think in many instances, you are better to go and get professional advice um, and, and err on the side of caution than what you are to sort of sit and wait for more red flags. So any significant changes in their behaviour, uh, any changes in their sleep habits or patterns, so are they staying up later, are they getting up earlier? Many parents are telling me their kids are getting up before much more earlier than what they used to to get their dose of digital while no one's supervising. Um, have there been any changes in their friendship circles? And again, that can be just a very natural stage of, of childhood and adolescent development. Um, are they showing symptoms of withdrawal? Um, so I know a family uh, recently who were telling me they're in um, a snowstorm. They weren't in Texas for this a little while ago. Um, and they had no Wi-Fi and they had no 4G or 5G connection, literally were unplugged. They had nothing. Um, and their son's behaviour became very, very pronounced, very aggressive, and they recognised that he was having almost like withdrawals. Well, not almost, they were withdrawal symptoms. It was, yeah. So when they don't have access to the technology, are they becoming agitated, frustrated, moody? Again, it's sometimes hard to disentangle what we would consider normal behaviour. Mm -hmm. um, are you seeing symptoms of what we call tolerance? So do they need to be watching for longer or playing more aggressive games or using a variety of social media platforms to get the same sense of satisfaction that they yeah. once had? So okay. they could be some significant yeah. indicators. Um, has there been a rapid decline in their academic performance? Um, that can also be a red flag for some problematic behaviours. So as I said, I think um, we don't have consistent diagnostic criteria for sort of 
unhealthy use. Um, there are some suggestions, but most of the suggestions say they need to present five red flags, five of these problematic behaviours, and they need to be identified for 12 months. I think that's far mm. too long. I think if there is a problem as a parent, I wouldn't be waiting to watch for 12 months right. worth of these symptoms. So I think go and seek medical advice. There are very well-trained um, psychologists who are you know, trained in this online space as well. So um, definitely seek advice and guidance and corroborate if it, you know with remote learning it might be more challenging but um, can you confirm information with other significant caregivers in the, the child's life so teachers sport coaches and see if you can sort of collectively pull together a picture as well yeah just reflecting back on what you said earlier about letting our kids be bored and just the output of when we don't do that routinely they I see this in kids where they, if they're so, it's so quickly filling this digital piece. It just fills the gap all the time. And it's this constant, constant fill that if we have kids that we allow to be in that space for a long period of time, for years, and then we decide, you know, we're going to pull back. It sounds like we should expect to see that they haven't yet developed the skills because they haven't had the opportunities to be bored long enough to problem solve for themselves to find new ways to fill a sense of creativity and engagement and connection and they haven't had to yeah, it's exactly right and it, i see boredom as in the 21st century as a learned skill um, i do a lot of work in the corporate space and i'm talking to some c-suite executives and i talk to them about the importance of digitally disconnecting and when i do there's this look of horror as if i'm you know presenting the worst possible scenario to them and the research tells us neuroscience yeah. calls it the default mode of thinking we call it the mind wandering mode and so when we daydream when we are bored our prefrontal cortex turns off and we ruminate, we come up, I don't know about you, Karen, but I often, um, you know, when I go for a run or a swim um, or I wake up at three in the morning, um, often a, a genius idea just drops in. Um, I don't have that same experience when I'm working on an Excel spreadsheet or replying to emails. So our brain needs that opportunity. So it's important for our physical health to, to have opportunities to be bored. It's important for our psychological well-being. Um, we get a concept of who we are. We get to have a rest, a, a psychological break from what we're processing online because we have, I call them ancient brains that are trying to operate in this high-tech world. And our brain was never designed to be plugged in and switched on all the time. Um, so having that opportunity, and it's also vital for ideation and creativity. Um, so unplugging, but we are terrible. A study was done a couple of years ago with adults and they said, look, just sit there and be bored for 15 minutes. And they had to prematurely end the study because the adult participants showed signs of psychological distress. They couldn't handle sitting there being bored for 15 minutes. Oh. They went back and they repeated iteration two of the study with ethics approval. And in the second version of the, the study, participants were given the option of self-administering a small electric shock in lieu of being bored for 15 minutes. 69% of males and 24% of females gave themselves an electric shock in lieu of being bored. So as adults, we've lost the art of being bored. We don't have white space. We fill every like minute of our white space with the digital intruder. Yeah. So yeah, oh, we're guilty powerful, too. Hey. Yeah. Well, we are. And then I think just about how our children learn, and what percentage of that is just from modeling. They do what they see. If we're attached to it all the time, constantly checking and putting it down in front of us, taking it to the meal table, bringing it to bed with us, scrolling before a meeting, that just sends a message of that's what we do to fill time. Definitely. And, you know, as a parent, it's not about saying you should never use technology in front of your yeah. kids. They certainly see, right. need not to see realistic. us using it. Yeah. yeah. But they also need to see us switching off. They need to see us walking the talk. Um, and I think this is a tricky topic, but I think uh, one that I feel really passionate about is that I'm worried as parents, we're missing, I call them the micro moments of connection with our kids. Mm. If we are constantly tethered to technology, you know, when they, when restrictions lift, um, and they go back to doing swimming lessons and they finally nail the tumble turn after months and months of practice, learning the tumble turn and they, they come up and the goggles are off their heads and the swimming caps pulled back and they they sit up to or stand up to give you the thumbs up 
and your head's buried in your phone. Um, you know, and they finally score the goal at soccer and you have been digitally disconnected. Those yeah. micro moments of connection are just so vital. Um, so I think it's important for us as adults to re-examine our digital behaviours as well. That's a lovely example. I was thinking the other day about our level of attunement with children mm -hmm. in the normal, average, almost missable moments, that those probably matter the most. It's not when our kid comes home with this crazy achievement certificate, or those are not the things we need to be celebrating to the, the you know, to that degree. But what about that moment that of magic that happens with them when they complete a puzzle at the kitchen table or when they invite you to come sit with them or share a song I want to tell you the songs I'm listening to or if we're not attending to that they just don't invite us in because we're we're just staring at something right if we're not yeah. available then they're not going to invite us in uh, in otherwise invitable moments yes availability Give me goosebumps okay. when you were yeah. talking about that yeah I think it's it's so important and it's confronting to hear. I know when I deliver this in, in person, um, I have the, the um, Cat Stevens song. Um, uh, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, got digital dementia. I can hear the song, um, <laughs> little boy, um, when are you coming home, oh, son? Yeah, I don't know when. Yeah, yeah, Cats in the Crate. Yes, thank you. You yeah. <laughs> remember that. Yeah. And I share some images of parents who are plugged in and missing those moments. And it's, you know, we just, we never get this time back with our kids. And I'm realistic. It's not about never using your technology around your kids. It's certainly important to see, but they also, we need to be available um, and offline so that they can plug into us. Um, pardon the pun. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Connection <gasps> in other ways, plugged in. Mm. So mindful and intentional. Yes. Being present. Yeah. Before we end today's call, uh, you, I often go back to this. I don't know what I don't know. So because this is not my world and not my land, uh, but this is yours. Can I just open it up to what's something you want so badly parents to hear? Is there something you'd love to be able to open mic? Just take it, take the control here and tell us what what should we what do you want us to know i think my big message is to plan don't ban technology um it's here to stay whether you love it or loathe it it is a portal for your child for their leisure for their learning um for their connection it is a portal to to their world um and i think if we want kids and adolescents to foster healthy habits um, they need to be able to use the technology, but they need to be able to use it with our, within our um, loving constraints. And that, that's us hovering, not hovering over, but hovering around, um, being that, that pilot of that digital plane and, and helping them with their boundaries, um, knowing what we know now about their, their limited prefrontal cortex being developed. Um, you know, it is completely unrealistic expectation that you give your toddler or even your teenager a tablet or a smartphone and expect them to say, look, that is a, you know, an hour watching YouTube is a sufficient amount. I'm going to turn it off and I'm going to go and set the dinner table. It's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to uh, assume that active role and establish those boundaries, preserve, make sure those basic needs aren't being eroded because of screens. And most importantly, um, model and value boredom. Um, and I think if we can get those things right, um, we will help our kids to develop these healthy habits because the technology, um, as the pandemic has made us all appreciate, um, you know, I couldn't have imagined doing homeschooling without access to technology. Um, I think it is here to stay and it's a vital, um, integral part of our kids' lives. So it's really, an, I think it's an important life skill that they learn. Some people are referring to it as digital hygiene, but they learn these fundamental skills that will set them up because I think if we asked many adults, I think we would admit that our digital habits and behaviours are out of control and that the technology controls us yeah. and not the other yeah. way around. We just, we can't have that for our young people who will inherit this digital world. Yeah. I'm so excited to be able to get this information out to parents. And I, I just want to, as a parent and as a professional in this area of supporting kids, I just want to say thank you for all the work that you do. Because Aww. without people who do this and pull it all together and deliver it in a way that we can actually hear, it's not just theory, it's well-grounded and we can hear that information for context, but 
you have such a gift for giving us tangible ways of translating that into what am I going to do when I wake up with my kids tomorrow morning? And that's always what I look for in, in trying to partner with other experts of just help us do that well. And so thank you so much for dedicating your life to this. I so appreciate it. Thank you. That means a lot. I'm very passionate about sharing this information. I was a a frustrated academic um, who could see all of this wonderful research being done, um, but I saw as a former teacher that it wasn't being disseminated to the people on the ground and it wasn't until I became a parent um, that I realised there's just so much misinformation, so many myths and misnomers about the online world and children. Um, so it seemed like a natural fit as a self-confessed nerd, um, an academic, someone who loves the research but gets frustrated when it isn't translated. Um, yeah. So to hear that means a lot. So thank you, Karen. Oh, thank you for your time today. I hope Pleasure. you have a lovely Sunday evening. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Take good care. Thanks so much. Bye for now.